So, my name is Petri Muje, and I'm working as a project manager in this uh, in this extra SMEs project in in Finland. And uh, I will not go into the details about the project. Most of you probably know the project. It's it's. Uh, connected to the development of aquaculture and especially let's say the the, the uh, frame where the aquaculture can can uh, can uh, be executed in 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 different countries so in this interreg europe project we have about uh, we have eight partners uh, from seven different european countries and districts uh, in this webinar, so we will have uh, presentations from uh, three three countries: from Finland, from Ireland, and from Poland. Uh, in fact, this is the second webinar today. We had earlier uh, the first, let's say, first session. It was in in uh, Finnish. Uh, we get very good overview um, concerning the Finnish government's political will about uh, they will they will soon the government will soon launch a new program uh, which aims to 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 increase the use of fish especially let's say locally fished or or produced fish the idea is that every Finn will eat one more fish dish every week. Let's see, it's very, very, very big change, let's say so. Uh, there was also the idea that we will increase the aquaculture, co uh, aquaculture production in Finland uh, two or three fold. And this is a this is a good goal, it's good vision, but of course, as in many other countries, uh, the challenge is that how we can at the same time increase the production and fulfill the environmental needs. We have very, let's say, strict environmental agency and it's it's very difficult to get the new, new uh, New, new law laws for 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 aquaculture production. But anyway, we have a full full government's government's uh, wish behind us, and let's see what we can what we can do. So I will give the floor to first presentation. Um, Mr. Spe Principal Specialist, or are you now group leader? I, I saw somewhere Petri Heini from, uh, from Nature Resources Institute Finland, and the topic is about uh, especially the aquaculture in, pres uh, in Finland present situation and, and what kind of future research needs we have in Finland. So please, Petri. Okay, hello everybody. Nice, nice to be here with you in this webinar. Uh, I distributed the project or the PowerPoint. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, I put it to the presentation mode. So I work in the Natural Resources Institute Finland, which is um, the major research institute. And uh, and uh, I have prepared this um, presentation from from also from my colleagues uh, um, material and and uh, I hope to be able to go through it the whole way. Let's see. Go forward. What's going on? OK, now it went. OK, about the Institute itself, we uh, have a, just uh, uh, renewed our strategy and, and we have four major research sectors. Uh, two of them circular bioeconomy and, and climate smart carbon cycle are not so much 
doing with the the fisheries even and, and aquaculture but but especially the profitable and responsible primary production and adaptive and resilient bioeconomy have have uh, the fish within it and uh, our aquaculture sector in Finland has two main lines the other one is rearing for restocking so stocking back to the waters and and also uh, preserving and and, and uh, re-establishing or restoring fish stocks in, in our waters and the uh, most main part of the species what we are stocking is our salmonids so salmon different trout char white fish and crailing and then also for pike birds and and even some cyprinids and pike from the crayfish we have the our native uh, noble crayfish which is uh, not doing so well and and there are some some aquaculture in 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 is re-establishing the stocks in, in, in uh, plate free areas and a major part of the production is in tanks in in fresh water and and uh, from some of the species in natural food ponds so white fish grayling and pike birds are for example produced over there for stocking purposes then the other major line is of course food fish production and their rainbow trout and European white fish are in, in the key role. Rainbow trout is the major species. And uh, nowadays some totally 15,000 tons is our production. So pretty much 14,000 is, is from rainbow trout. And there is also slight sturgeon, brown trout and Arctic char rearing for food fish also. And uh, also, the raw or caviar for human consumption is, is a valuable sector within the aquaculture. And uh, production is done in sea cages, flow through farms, and in recycling aquaculture systems or rust systems. And we have two different production environments the mainland of Finland where we have the older flow through farms in freshwater, rivers and lakes, and new rust farms on land. And uh, food feed production and all of the brood stocks, egg and fingerling production is, is done in there. Then we have the coastal areas, um, especially in the western, southwestern coast. Uh, so which area is brackish water area, so not very salty. Uh, we have floating net cages over there and on growing of to final size and, and uh, uh, some 85 percent of the of the food fish production is done in the coastal areas. And then about the fish stockings in, in Finland. Uh, so, so I am here talking about uh, one summer old and older individuals. We have had a, a fairly long steady decline in the amounts of uh, stockings since late 1980s. Um, and um, the major reasons for this has been that uh, some species have uh, started to establish a renewing uh, wild stocks. So, like for pike birds, we have been able to, to let's say, cut down on the amount of stockings when when the wild production has reached reasonable uh, amounts. And um, then, then the other thing has been that. Uh, in, especially here in the violet, the brown drought stocks, um, uh, uh, stockings have been going down as as there is also this uh, direction to 
stock or use uh, eggs or, or, or newly hatched fries in, in establishing those stocks in wild. And the value of the uh, our stocked feces are nowadays something 16 million euros per year. And, and uh, salmon and trout are, of course, the most important species in value. And then about the pros and cons in our operational environment, we have uh, lots of good quality waters in lakes, and rivers and coastal areas. We have good infrastructure, stable environment for enterprises. And uh, innovative aquaculture sector, intensive production methods, high value species and strong research and development. But then we have as a cons or problems, strict environmental legislation, heavy permission procedure, small permit sizes, rather small company size, and tight competition on domestic markets with Norwegian salmon in the food fish sector. Uh, half of the Finnish, Finnish fish in the fish market is farmed. And over here you can see the red area imported salmon eats. So its importance has raised remarkably to the present level. In the lower part you see the rainbow trout and uh, green white fish over here, our domestic farming farm product production is, is been fairly stable recent years. It hasn't increased the way we have wished. And uh, only 19 percent of the commercial food fish is, is domestic at the moment. And the stages in the development of aquaculture in Finland we see in the 1980s, we had a profitable growth over here, and then for since 1990s onwards, there was an adjustment to world market. We joined the EU and uh, and uh, environmental constraints, and for two decades. We had this kind of uh, regressive production and tightening environmental policy within Finland. And um, since 2010, there has been a turn in this. We have uh, had more research and development cooperation, new technologies, and, and then therefore also new growth. And also the value of the production has, has started to increase more. And uh, the focus on aquaculture research at the same time in, in, in 1980s, it was the production methods. Uh, in 1990s, uh, new fish species were introduced like, like white fish. Uh, and, and there was also diminishing nutrient loading. And uh, then the next two decades, uh, it was feed research, genetic selection, new species and technologies. We started the uh, breeding programs for rainbow trout and, and whitefish. And, and uh, nowadays, uh, in the main concern are, are the site selection, feeds, recycling nutrients and new technologies. And uh, if you look at the moment, uh, the status quo of our aquaculture, uh, the fry production here on the left is, is some one fifth of the total turnover of the companies and, and it's getting a, a little bit better profit out of it in the inland food production. The level is fairly low, but it is also going for profitable side. Then the marine food fish production is a major part where the companies make the, the turnover and also the profitability has raised. But then the rust cycle, rust production, uh, the level is still fairly low and the major problem is that it's not profitable at the moment. 
and um, <clears throat> there are two main problems how to receive new licensee for traditional production and and how to make rust production profitable and uh, our aquaculture research cooperation we majority of the products uh, pro projects uh, the, in the study of the food fish production there was uh, production biology and technologies feed development economics environmental policies and fish biology water treatment technologies business economics fish nutrition genetics microbiology regional planning and geoinformatics we have some some pilots and international developing projects and, and some some customer um, funding where feed development and, and rust feasibility studies and, and minor part of the research and development serves natural fish stocks but then we have uh, quite a bit of uh, activity in the in the genetic resources work and um, the three main areas of, of the work and research cooperation is, is the gates farming in the Baltic Sea, especially the offshore uh, aspects. And uh, there's marine planning, spatial planning, technology transfer and experimental work at the companies and, and uh, fisheries school, Olivia. Then the, the recycling systems. Uh, combination of biology and technology research and internationally competent research infrastructure in, in Lauka nowadays. Then selective breeding program uh, and work on genetic resources. Uh, we have the uh, breeding program going on and it will be moved in the future to Lauka, new facilities in Lauka starting next year. And uh, new school operations with, uh, for example, universities is my microbiology in controlling uh, rust water quality, machine learning in fish welfare research and aquaculture management, and um, aquaculture and fisheries governance research and possible aquaponics. The spatial planning has been going on and, and through it. Uh, there is, of course, uh, 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 let's say, important issue to get more or new places for aquaculture farms in, in the coastal areas and, and partially also in the inland waters. And um, the condition and environmental impact measures have also been developed in cooperation with the Environmental Institute and and this is critical to show so one of the effluence effects from the fish farms <clears throat> and uh, future development in of these tools and and climate change is is, is this, we have a this kind of film farm cis and is a static cis tool and, and uh, presents general information of the environment and suitable of the of an area for aquaculture activities and more input how input of how aquaculture changes the environment and the ecological status and with the cooperation with the environmental institute then there is uh, with the metsahallitus uh, governmental water Waters, uh, let's say, uh, authority, which um, we try to develop system where we had certain licensing ready for the companies in the in the state waters, and 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 uh, this would help for companies in 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 starting farming in this area. Then. Uh, cooperation with the Finnish Meteorological Institute to estimate different scenarios and how they impact where aquaculture is practiced in the future, also possibly related to climate change issues. And different practices for aquaculture in possible 
future scenarios where we try these kind of submergible fish farms or new species for growth. And uh, at the moment we have one this kind of experimental <laughs> submergible fish farm over here in the southwestern coast. And as uh, through the spatial planning, the offshore areas are the ones that has the most possibilities for future farming places. Here just is this uh, cage going down below the water, water surface. Then there is the recycling aquaculture systems. Uh, we have four different type of experimental units in, in, in Lauka. And uh, and uh, the key role in RAS is, is the ammonia and nitrate uh, uh, removal from the from the water. Uh, we have the research topics on bioreactor setup and disinfectants and intensity of RAS. And uh, here you see this kind of moving bed and, and uh, uh, this kind of static bed. Then we have this kind of treatment areas uh, really taking uh, or treatment, treating the effluents from the recycling systems where we have this wood chip, first wood chip, uh, the nitrification, uh, then, then uh, this kind of uh, small vertical wetland and, and then the last area, artificial results of groundwater. So, uh, sand bed area and then you are able to reuse the water from this treatment field. And then the national selective breeding group um, for rainbow trout and white fish and uh, we have this genetic selection of the brood, creating new brood stocks, creating separate families out of them and, and tacking them at the moment to rear them by the families to certain and, and measuring and testing of this um, in, in the fresh water system. And then we have the test environmentals at the same time in, in, the, in the sea gates area and developing one, one for the recycling systems. And uh, we are using Finnish um, uh, companies, uh, let's say data collecting systems. And uh, here you see the as the food feed production has increased to to this present level. At the same time, the feed conversion at, at the farms has decreased by. 53 percent it's and part of this this um, development has come from the breeding program but partially also developing uh, feeds in the wild uh, material there is uh, enriched rearing for production scale for stocking developing the stocked feces and and uh, there is, uh, st well, let's say, comparison between a standard uh, rearing system to this kind of enriched environment with the uh, uh, rocks or uh, stones in different stages of the rearing of the fish. And, and uh, uh, this, uh, as this gives a shelter to the fish, so we have these benefits for the fish, higher feeding rate of natural food better growth and chances of in, in the nature after the release to wild, increasing survival in nature, less fish for stocking needed, would, could be cost efficient, less vulnerable to angling, more difficult to capture, and, and more fish for the uh, natural reproduction, and enhances also disease resistance of fish in the rearing tanks, less medicine needed and lower mortality and which is then cost efficient. Then uh, just as the last, we have this uh, preservation of fish stocks 
in Finland and and uh, those we have here the figures uh, what we have in the gene bank different stocks and in the milk bank and and we are mainly taking care of the most endangered species here we in Finland we have critically endangered land of salmon arctic char and sea, sea spawning grayling and and then the endangered sorry that's not should be en migratory white fish and sea trout and brown trout and invulnerable species white fish species and and baltic and atlantic salmon and, and southern grayling and uh, in our living gene bank so called brood stocks we have totally 17 fish species or forms, 58 different fish strains and lamprey. Out of them, 12 are native species for Finland and 15, 50 strains. And our brood stock is some 50,000 fishes in the beginning of the year. And uh, the brood stocks are renewed every three to five years. And and Brood fish live mostly up to 10 to 15 years. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Petri. Um, is there any any questions? And 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 as a chairman, I have a possibility to to uh, comment or ask you the first question. So, so in in fact, in Finland, if we think to aquaculture and professional fisheries, so we have to remember that some of professional fisheries is depend on on the stockings. We can we can talk about, for example, the white fish fisheries in certain lakes, for example, in Finland. Or, or also Baltic salmon. So we stock a lot of material which is also also growing so that it is used as a, as a target species, target target fish for the professional fisheries. So in that sense, aquaculture and professional fisheries are engaged with each each other. And and of course this comes from that we have a some some rivers, some lakes which are regulated, so there is kind kind of uh, kind of court decision that we have to stock certain amount of fish there to compensate the the, the loss. So, do we have any any? Any questions? You can just open your 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 microphone and ask if you want, or you can type the question if you wish so. There is a silence. <laughs> Petri, you have have been very very. You have presented your 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 presentation very well because everyone is happy. Everybody is done. Uh, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay, so uh, if aha, okay, Ian is typing something. Ah, so there is the excellent presentation. I am Brannigan, who is our 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 uh, project leader in 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 Ireland. Yeah, Petri, I I you I you're 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 too attentive there, seeing me typing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but for the the one thing that did actually jump out in terms of innovation um, was the submersible submersible submergible fish tanks. Um, can you give any more details on that? Um, how far along are you on that? Uh, so uh, that was um, bought from uh, Italy last last summer, and and uh, so now we have uh, used it last year, and 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 uh, also submerged it for the winter. But um, there was there's lots of uh, 
problems with it. It's it's not so easy easy to run. Of course, it's up to the place that there was very strong currents yeah. uh, when it was also submerged, and and that was uh, I think one of the uh, let's say not not expected earlier. Of course, uh, you normally put the net gates into a place where you have a good current to get uh, the water renewed well and, and, and the nutrients uh, disappear into larger water mass. But um, then also a small amount of fish was left to the uh, gates uh, for the winter. And, and the problem was that they died during that and, and we are not not now, so what was the reason? That, was it uh, still uh, such an area that uh, the water went too cold in the winter time? So because we can have minus uh, degrees in the water, and so so it's it's not it was not so easy that uh, I think we in the first place were thinking that this this should be a good system, but we need to learn those uh, more let's say precise those what's happening there underneath the water level and and then that program is our project is going on and, and we are developing the our understanding with this because uh, otherwise the companies are not putting money into that kind of system yeah i, I was interested petri because we had uh, an investment from um, um, a submerged um, seaweed uh, manufacturer but okay. they were the technology was stacked so they were moving it through to the nutrient zone uh, and i was just wondering have, have you had some any problems so you, you've answered my question so that, that that's actually very helpful thank you yeah okay you're welcome mm -hmm. okay and uh, ronan uh, wrote that thanks for the excellent and interesting presentation i was wondering if you could provide a link to the article presented for the 53 percent F uh, fcr slide and figure a very positive trend in reducing resources use and demand. Um, of course, this presentation will be available also, and and, and uh, yeah, and that's that's possible to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, so maybe we will uh, we will continue to next presentation, and it will be the Ronan Coney from from Ireland, Aquaculture and Circular and Economy. Uh, and regional aspects and and maybe you can first shortly introduce you what kind of project and what 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 kind of things you are doing yeah uh, one second i'll just try and share the screen uh is that working no wrong screen uh yeah, yes so we can see it yeah it's gone again um, yeah. Uh, technology is fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just open my camera as well. So yeah, um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for the invitation to present here today. Um, and it was really interesting to see an overview of uh, aquaculture in in Finland. Um, uh, so first off, my name is Ronan Cooney. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Um, we're part of a group called Morfish, which predominantly looks at increasing resource efficiency and, and, and usage within um, aquaculture in, in Ireland. Um, so today I'm just going to give a kind of a, an overview of Irish aquaculture, um, our, our research group, the projects we're involved with and how we're implementing circular economy kind of strategies and philosophies into supply chains and production chains in Ireland uh, through uh, an interreg funded project called Neptunus. So if I can move on. So just overview of the presentation, research group projects, the background to Irish aquaculture, some of the case studies and, and uh, results that we have to date, the future work that we hope to do and, and the acknowledgements of our funders and, um, and collaborators and, and who we uh, coordinate the project with. So just moving on to our research group, uh, more fish was set up in about 2015. Uh, the core companies of the group at the time were engineering, ecology, chemistry, ecotoxicology. From that, then we've kind of moved more and more into the realm of life cycle assessment and sustainability assessments. So from the initial Morfish project, we've had four subsequent projects. So from 2017 up to 2021, 
Uh, EcoAqua was the follow on project for Moorfish, which we looked at a life cycle assessment of uh, pretty much most of the freshwater aquaculture sector in Ireland. We looked at water quality impacts, recovery potential for the sector. Um, so one of the interesting results we saw from this project was for freshwater aquaculture sites that the ecological quality recovered within 1000 metres. Uh, we also looked at developing um, biodiversity impact indicators for life cycle assessment studies. Uh, and this was underpinned using the Water Framework Directive. Um, so we're hoping to have something out later on uh, this year on that. Uh, overall, the Moorfish Group has four core researchers. And again, our areas are life cycle assessment, sustainability, remote monitoring, sludge, valorization strategies, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm just gonna mention one or two things about these are the kind of the three projects that we're currently working on. So AquaCatch is a, is a project where we've we're investigating the use of life cycle assessment as a catchment based planning tool. And it kind of uh, goes back to the talk, uh, the previous talk where we're talking about site selection. So essentially what we're looking at is the economic, the social and the environmental impacts of aquaculture within a catchment based activity, comparing it and looking at it across different sectoral activities. And the idea behind it is it's pretty simple. It's is there a better use for certain land in, in in Ireland particularly. So the, this study catchment is um, quite low productivity land. The site, the aquaculture site takes up two hectares and produces about 200 tonnes of um, salmon smalls per annum. And it's just kind of see, is there is there a better use rather than, you know, just dispersed activities like, like um, agriculture. Uh, Shell Aqua is actually a project that we just uh, were successfully funded for in the past few weeks. It's, a, it's actually a very interesting kind of a, a project because it came from our current project, Neptunus. And as part of Neptunus, we were dealing with uh, a lot of um, small to medium enterprises up and down the, the west coast of Ireland. And as part of it, we try and try and take a very um, a proactive approach with engaging with industry and try and produce tangible outputs. So one of the things that industry kept mentioning when we asked them, what would they like the results of Neptunus to um, to link back to, and they said the ecosystem services. Um, a lot of the shellfish producers are very interested in wh what they're not only producing a product, but they're also providing a service, and they want to know what's the the extent of the service. So this this Shell Aqua project is going to link back to um, waste stream valorization, ecosystem services, and leaving kind of tools and and characterizing the uh, the sector for for shellfish aquaculture in Ireland. Uh, Neptunus is the main project I'm going to discuss today. So it's a consortium made up of 11 uh, core research partners scattered across the Europe, the, the Atlantic area. So there's two universities from Ireland, uh, two from um, Portugal, uh, one from France and a couple of other industry partners. Uh, the overall idea of it is to mix. Uh, it's a good blend of um, industry, academics and uh, non-governmental organizations. Overall, the project is moving more and more towards circular economy philosophies. And as part of the project, we're looking at developing um, a suite of kind of data sets, uh, tools, etc., to look at sustainable production and consumption, life cycle thinking and LCA, climate change, marine debris, and uh, circular economy strategies. So overall, the project has five work packages. So the first one here, and which might be of use or interest to people who are involved in life cycle assessment, is the development of life a life cycle inventory for seafood production along the Atlantic area, looking at technical strategies under a circular economy approach for essentially packaging, primary, secondary and tertiary packaging. We're looking at threats and challenges to uh, aquaculture and uh, marine fisheries. So looking at marine debris, climate change and how we can transition to a green economy. Uh, the one that I, we're actually the work package leader for is uh, the biological cycle strategies under a circular economy framework. And within that, we're looking at nutrient recovery techniques and technologies, and also strategies to prevent seafood waste and loss uh, throughout that supply chain. Overall, these four work packages I've, I've just mentioned here, they link back into what we hope is going to be um, a, a very interesting and exciting eco label, where we look at the nexus uh, approach between water, energy and nutrients. So uh, that's Neptunus, and I'm just going to talk about Irish freshwater aquaculture. Uh, Damien Toner, I think, is the next speaker, so I, I'm not going to go into 
too much detail on it in case there's a, a little bit of overlap between uh, the content Mr. and Damien are talking about. So typically a thousand tons of freshwater salmon or freshwater salmonids are produced per annum. Uh, three species of, of interest to the sector, uh, two of them are salmonids, so Atlantic salmon and rainbow trout, and a novel species introduced in the last couple of years, uh, Eurasian perch. Typically the sector is comprised of tank and pond based flow through systems, very minimal water reuse and uh, as I'm sure that people have heard Ireland is a, a very wet country and it's true which kind of limits the necessity for water reuse. Also one of the main barriers to the uptake of recirculating aquaculture systems is that uh, most of the Irish sector is geared towards the organic uh, market and products coming from a, a research system can't be can't be classified as organic. Uh, in recent years as well there's been a strategic plan for sustainable development of aquaculture where it aims to increase annual output to 81,000 tonnes uh, up from a current 40,000 tonnes. So in 2020 that figure was actually 38,000 tonnes so this twofold increase is, is quite ambitious. Uh, as part of this plan, it's expected that the industry will see some expansion from the currently operating 15 sites in, in the country. Um, and three of these sites account for almost uh, over half of um, the sector, the freshwater sectoral output. And no more than anywhere else in Europe or, and indeed the world probably, licensing is seen as a, a significant hindrance to investment and modernization of the sector, particularly with the, the short license times that are, are, are available. Um, so for the marine sector again, uh, moving on then, we're looking at about 1800 people employed per annum. 2020, the marine aquaculture sector was valued at 180 million. Again, typically 40,000 tonnes, three main species uh, similar to the freshwater sector, uh, Atlantic salmon, Pacific oyster and blue mussel. Uh, this 15,000 tonne figure for blue mussel is actually for both, um, it's a summation of uh, rope grown and bottom grown mussels as well. Uh, since 2016, all uh, salmon in Ireland is, is organic and classified so under the EU organic regulations. Uh, more and more recently, we're seeing a trend where um, mussel growers are moving more and more towards their organic status as well. Um, with this 40,000 tonne capacity at the moment, Ireland can't really compete in terms of volume on, a, on, a on an international scale. So what, what the sector is moving more and more towards is, is, is a value. So the most recent figures show that Ireland is fifth in value and seventh in volume for, for EU aquaculture. The 20, uh, 2020 COVID-19 uh, outbreak did negatively impact the, the sector, particularly the shellfish producers as they saw a 19% decrease in the value for oysters and 11% uh, for rope mussels. So again this is kind of mainly dri driven from the food service industry and the lack of um, hotels and uh, restaurants being open. Uh, conversely, uh, salmon actually saw an increase in value, and this is mainly driven by frozen frozen portion sales. Um, so the next slide then is something that I've mentioned a little bit before. So it's life cycle assessment. Um, it's an ISO standardized procedure of biophysical accounting technique, assesses the material energy flows associated with a product or a production system, and we construct these flows and materials around a functional unit. So typically in aquaculture, it's a kilo or a ton of uh, fish to the farm gate. Uh, four, four, four main stages within LCA, goal and scope, uh, an inventory analysis where we look at the material flows in and out, the impact assessment where we characterize the results and look at um, it, it, the climate change potential, eutrophication, acidification, and then finally the interpretation and application of the results. So LCA has been used extensively in fisheries and aquaculture systems, over 65 studies on aquaculture and aquafeed systems alone. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Finland was one of the first countries to produce uh, LCA of aquaculture, I think it was back in 2001 or 2002. Um, it was on rainbow trout and then there was a subsequent study to that in 2006. So uh, I, I may be uh, preaching to the choir on this um, on the, this particular aspect. So. But typically within LCA of aquaculture, we see that feed and energy are the primary drivers of environmental impact and environmental burden. Um, so within that, uh, we have conducted a number of LCA studies on salmonids. So particularly for um, the, these, these two freshwater salmon sites, farm A and B, they produce about um, half, about roughly half of all um, salmon smolts in Irish freshwater, the Irish freshwater sector. Uh, feed and energy, primary drivers of the burden. 
water and liquid oxygen are higher than other studies um, uh, previously reported. Now, the only two studies that I was able to compare fully with the full uh, life cycle assessment based on the freshwater hatchery stage of production were from uh, China and Australia. Uh, two very different regions, two very different environments. So it kind of draws back to a, a wider comment within LCA uh, studies and literature that we need to increase more and more the amount of information that we have available so that people can replicate and interrogate the results of these um, these projects or the, 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 these studies. Uh, from the sensitivity and scenario analysis we applied to these sites, food conversion ratio was the most efficient way to reduce burden. Um, so for the trout sector, or for the trout site as well, then we were able to show that animal byproducts uh, dominated the impacts of this this particular site. Um, so we can see here that the the green represents the um, the um, environmental impact of, of of trout production, and while the use of animal byproducts and its valorization of these kind of waste products that were typically not not used in agriculture. They have a lower net primary production use or, or biotic resource use, which is essentially the amount of uh, carbon that's removed from a, a food food system and made unavailable to um, to other uh, other organisms. It also had a lower cumulative energy demand, which is the amount of energy from uh, resource material extraction all the way through to the the, the end of life. Um, so it's beneficial in in that regard, but it does have other higher impacts, particularly in, when it comes to global warming potential or climate change potential. So water use for this particular site was was higher than had previously reported, and similar to the the uh, the salmon site, food was the uh, was the primary way to reduce the environmental impact, and it was was simply as efficient as as um, switching to a, a, a different feed. So overall, for these commercially significant species uh, for Irish aquaculture, freshwater aquaculture, water use was higher than other other studies. And again, possibly a, a reflection of climatic conditions and the availability of water. And despite the fact that all feed is imported into Ireland, it's a relatively minor contributor to the overall uh, life cycle impacts of, um, of freshwater aquaculture production. Uh, we've also conducted a life cycle assessment of uh, perch, uh, perch hatchery and A, B, C and D. A, B, C and average here indicate the uh, different batches. So this site was uh, a little bit novel. Uh, there were a number of data sets because it was a, primarily an experimental site, but it has since then become the main hatchery for perch production in Ireland. Uh, we needed to go back to a base principles approach or an ab initio approach to, in order to overcome these da data deficits. So we had to rely on um, what, what, what site information was available and also balance that with growth modeling, thermodynamic modeling and water treatment. So the end goal of this was, um, or the end product even, was a, a tool that could be used for site management. and. The, the the managers can can use that. Uh, so the life cycle assessment of Eurasian perch was conducted. What we're able to see as well is that there was a high degree of variability between the batches, uh, which indicates that the system may not, or at the time of the study, was not in, in steady state. The system, uh, because it was a research system, had a lower water use, but it did have higher global warming potential, acidification and eutrophication. But again, very different to a flow through system because of uh, the biologies of the spe species that are cultured and the nature of the system, high tech versus uh, low tech. Uh, one of the ways to reduce the impact was would be to increase the throughput at the site and to lower the food conversion reversion ratio. And again, similar trends across the board. Uh, as part of these, the study and this project, we looked at different um, impact reduction opportunities. So we we modeled and assessed the sludge that was available at the salmon sites, and we're able to show that about if they were able to valorize this and account for it back against the farm's total emissions for 2018, uh, farm A would be able to reduce 18.5% of its carbon emissions for 2018, and farm B, 6.4%. And another strategy that we'll be investigating in the future is to include within the life cycle model not only the valorization of the sludge to energy, but also the sludge as a fertilizer. Uh, another aspect that we covered as well was uh, energy recovery from discharged waters and we were able to show that the lower tech site, which was Farm C, which was the trout site, um, had a higher volume of water passing through the site and a lower energy requirement, but it did have the opportunity or the capacity to, in to recover about 31% of its, its energy uh, for 2018. So this was done look modeling using different, different technologies, so overshot and undershot weirs, cross flow, an Archimedes screw turbine and a technology that's in development at NUI Galway called an annular jet turbine. Um, so moving back and closer back to the circular economy, 
as part of Neptunus, we are leading this work package biological cycle strategies under a circular economy framework. From this, we'll be characterizing the waste streams from fisheries, aquacultures and uh, seafood processing. And we're also in the process of developing uh, several case studies on systems and products and processes of natural um, natural significance across the Atlantic area, but particularly for Ireland. So we'll be looking at salmon, oysters and mussel production. We'll be looking at nutrient recovery opportunities within the supply chain. And we'll also be looking at prevention strategies for seafood loss and waste. Um, so currently we're in the characterization of these waste streams. And just in this slide, I'm going to just talk about the two kind of main, main, main groups. So organic salmon and then shellfish down here. So within organic salmon production, what we see um, is that almost by its nature and because it's dealing with a constrained supply. So typically about 14,000 to 16,000 tons of salmon is produced per annum. So we have a lot of ancillary industries with a lot of processors uh, who are looking for raw material so that they can produce products. Because they're dealing with such a constrained supply, almost nothing is wasted from uh, a carcass. So the mortalities are sent for either energy, they're sent as fish meal, fish oil. The frames are either sent for fish meal, fish oil, or value added products such as organic uh, dog food. Um, heads similar to similar to that, uh, dog food, or exported to China as a high value uh, product. Uh, initially, other pieces of meat or the trimmings are recovered and now sold as a, as a high value product for um, for salads and to use as a, as, as, a, as a novel kind of a, a salad dressing. Uh, so the only waste product really from some of the processors that we're dealing with is the skins. And currently there are uh, there are trials to see can they develop you know high value uh, pet food treats. So smoked salmon skins as a dog treat. Um, essentially trying to close that loop in 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 food loss and food waste within this um, within the supply chain uh, for shellfish typically what we see is that shells are they, they have a have a variety of prospective um, opportunities for valorization and and use currently they are used as a construction material on sites uh, generally so across the, the Atlantic area, we're, we're looking at a project which is looking at regionalized circular economy strategies for this, this material. So in Galicia, in, in northern Spain, they use it as a fertilizer. And possibly we'll, what we'll be doing as part of this project is to look at how do we increase the uptake and valorize and commodify this, this waste stream. So it can be used as a, as a feed supplement because it's high in calcium, could be used as a feedstock for bio-based plastics, or for limited applications, it could be used as a building material or a supplementary uh, component in, in building. So the, the, these are the, the kind of characterization of these two waste streams that at the moment as they stand. Another aspect that we're looking, for, looking at is the best available technologies or techniques for nutrient recovery. And this will be underpinned using a life cycle assessment based approach. So typically what we want to look at is um, energy for, excuse me, uh, fertilizer, animal feed, food and high value biotechnology or pharmacy based um, products. So these options typically go from energy being the lowest value to pharma being the highest value. And as part of that, we'll be looking at what's the best technology available, what's the best option available, and what are the best outputs available within each of the Atlantic area uh, countries involved in the project. So from this, we'll be able to, again, arrive at circular economy based strategies for each of the Atlantic area countries, and particularly for um, for, for some of the, for some of the markets, it, it it will be a very interesting um, output. Uh, so I think I'm at 22 minutes at the moment. So I'm going to close it up. So just in summary, we have a number of actions in play to develop circular economy strategies uh, through engaging with small to medium enterprises in Ireland at the Atlantic area, and we've. We have a lot done, but we have so much more to do in this area, and uh, we're, we're just about scratching the surface at the moment. Uh, so I just want to say, uh, acknowledge our funders. Uh, so the BIM, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, and the Atlantic Area uh, Interreg Commission. And also we, we need to act, really acknowledge the SMEs, the companies, and the individuals who support and partake in the data collection and generation of these projects. Uh, without without their involvement, without their engagement, well, without them uptaking the, the results we produce, 
uh, it's yeah, we're kind of screaming in the wilderness. <laughs> so uh, thanks very much for your attention. And uh, if there's any questions, um, I don't know if we have much time left, but if there's any questions, you, you can ask me now or you can contact me at orcooney at nuigalway.ie. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ronan. If there is any questions, so please you can you can ask it or, or write it to the chat. Um, the perch, it was quite interesting. Uh, is it also local fish for you? I'm asking this because the perch is, is Finnish national fish. We have okay. it almost everywhere, um, everywhere except in very northern part of Finland where, it, where the waters are cold and the char or brown trout is the only at, le, at least the, the, the yeah. used fish. Um, it is very high valued also in Finland um, and I know that there is no aquaculture going on as such with this species. Petri Heinemar can comment that also. I, I know that they had earlier some, some experiments where they were um, catching some specimens from wild and taking them to net cages and started to, to feed them. But as far as I know, they were not that successful ones. Yes. Do you, Petri Heinima, know something about the perch farm? I, I, can, I can comment that uh, we have had, uh, let's say, a couple projects uh, see, uh, seeing or looking at uh, the birds as as uh, mm. aquaculture product, but uh, <clears throat> they have not, um, so let's say, pro provinced so good yeah. uh, production, and and so Finland has gone more to the pike birds in in mm. that. So as they are very very close in that respect. So yeah. and and both are very highly valued species anyhow. So. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, Damien, Damien may know may more may know more about this, and he may talk a bit more about it because uh, Damien is is pretty much the perch expert for for Ireland. Uh, since the early two thousands, he's been kind of leading the development of um, you know perch aquaculture in Ireland and and really promoting it. Uh, so th this particular site was a pilot site for uh, a, a location. I'm pretty sure he's going to to cover. So I, I, I don't want to kind of steal Damien's thunder uh, too much too much. But um but but yeah, no, it's it's typically what, what they're targeting is to de develop this capacity and export it to alpine regions in um oh, yeah. in so so particularly Sweden and I think or not Sweden, uh, sorry, Switzerland and uh, France. Um I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure what the what the status is of the, the project currently because this was done um the, the the results of this are about a year, a year or more old. But um, but yeah, I think I think Damien will probably cover it a bit more. Uh, but 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 if not, uh, I could I can I can discuss for, for longer about it. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Ron and I also find very interesting your your uh, slides about the use of side streams because in Finland we have at the moment. I know that they have earlier sold some some side stream, for example, to. Russia, which is not effective at the moment for the political reasons, as you know. Um, I wonder, have we in contact with you later? Because uh, at the moment, in in for example, in Lapland, so the side streams and even uh, let's say small size um, catch, which is not used by the humans. So in in fact, we dig them into the forest. We, we make a hole and just put them there and leave them there. Hmm. So we, which is the way which is awful waste of, of good protein or whatsoever. So we are all the time looking for a, for a new ways to use the side streams. Of course, there is this kind of biogas production, but I, I would like to see it in, in, in some other use feed of animals or, or Pet yeah. feeds, they have a good potential. We all know that uh, that these companies which are dealing with the pet food, so they are they can be very profitable. Let's say so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, I'm feeling the the barrier that we're, we're going to encounter with these valorization strategies is that there just isn't going to be enough 
raw material available to support a domestic kind of uh, situation for, where it can be be used you know like with 16,000 tons of salmon produced and almost everything currently being used and it, 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 I think it's it's going to be difficult. I think um, I met with Ian last week, and I think they're running into some some issues as well with that the material isn't available for. I think it was the plastics, uh, Ian. Uh, so it, it's yeah, it, it's it's quite because we're such a small country and our capacity is limited. It the impact that these these strategies and results might have uh, it will be somewhat limited. But I think that that's the interesting thing with collaborating with larger economies and larger countries like France, Spain. I think uh, Spain alone has 147,000 tons of shellfish bio, bio waste every year, just in the just in the shells alone. Um, so the strategies that we develop may, may have greater impact in, in those markets where that material is more more widely available and readily available, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree you. And, and if we think the, this northern part of Finland, Lapland. So, in fact, this is at least one third of of the geographical area of Finland. We have uh, totally 180,000 people, which means that we have more reindeer here than people. And in fact, uh, population density is around one person per square kilometer. And you can imagine that uh, fish farm and especially the professional fisheries, it's not taking part in the into the towns or, or cities. So we are very sparsely populated and the logistics and, and amount of of, uh, of side stream in, in one place is very limited. So this this is a constraint of for whole, whole system. Yeah. 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 Very similar, very similar problems. <laughs> Okay, I think there is no more question at the, at the moment. So um, yeah, thanks we much. will continue to Damien. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. Loud and clear. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, well, firstly, thanks for the opportunity to um, give you a brief presentation on what's happening in Ireland. I'll probably touch on some of the topics that Ronan covered there, so uh, forgive me for that. Um, so I work for BIM, which is the State Development Agency in Ireland, responsible for um, developing the seafood industry. Uh, I'm in the Development and Innovation Division there. And uh, just to give you a, a kind of a very brief overview of what BIM does, we're, we were established in 1952, and our role really is to provide technical and business advice to the seafood industry, so fish farmers, fishermen, and processors. And we also administer EMFF funding on behalf of the department and the EU through a number of grant schemes to our clients, to, so to fish farmers and, and fishermen. Uh, we have head offices in Dublin. We also have uh, regional officers based all around the coast. And in addition to that, we have the Seafood Innovation Hub, which is based in Clonakilty in County Cork, which helps processors to develop new products. And we have a number of seafood training centres which deliver training programmes to the industry. So tech can courses, uh, skipper courses for fishermen, uh, diving courses for fish farmers, things like that. So I mean, obviously 2020 was a funny year for everybody, but if we look at it in terms of the seafood industry in Ireland, we, we have a value in aquaculture of around 180 million. And that's from around 300 uh, aquaculture production units. And really the kind of the, 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 the star performer and all that is, is salmon. So organic salmon production is around 120 million. And um, that kind of dominates our aquaculture production. 
We have about 1,800 people employed in the industry, and the majority of that is along the western seaboard. So from Donegal down to Castletown Bear, we have uh, salmon farms, oyster farms, mussel farms. And then further along the coast, along the south and east, we have also oyster and mussel operations. And then in, inland, we have some, some trout farms. In terms of production and value, um, the total value last year was actually up by about 2%, which is 180 million. But you can see that's predominantly salmon. Uh, second, then we have oysters around 37 million, and then mussels combined is about 13 million. And by value, we produce around 13 and a half thousand tons of salmon. Uh, that can fluctuate from time to time, but that's kind of the average. And then we have about 14,000 tons of mussels and about 9,000 tons of oysters. So in terms of volume, the, the sector is not that big in terms of European production. However, it, it where it really stands out is in terms of value. And the reason for that is Ireland has tended to focus on developing niche value products and targeting niche markets. So we're not really involved or interested in the commodity game. So um, our salmon is all organic, 100% uh, organic production. Our oysters would tend to target high value markets in France and more recently in Asia, particularly in China and Hong Kong. So we don't tend to produce an awful lot of production, but what we do tend to produce tends to be of high value. So I mentioned we have a number of schemes that we administer on behalf of the department uh, and they target uh, helping the industry to expand or improve efficiencies. Uh, so within the aquaculture remit, we have about five or six schemes. One of them I'm gonna just mention in the context of this workshop, which is the KGS program. So that funds uh, work, uh, the, the, the work that Ronan just outlined was funded by KGS. It's a knowledge gateway scheme program. So we utilize uh, EMFF funding to fund industry and academia to do research and development on behalf of industry. Generally, those projects would be funded over a period of two to four years. And generally as well, they need to be at TRL level seven to eight. So really we're looking for projects where they're ready to be deployed in industry or on demonstration farms. So we don't tend to fund real early stage research. We tend to focus on uh, projects, products and services that are, are have been developed and are ready to be deployed and tested. Uh, in, in regard to early stage research, the majority of that is funded and done by the Marine Institute, not by BAM, although we do collaborate on, on a wide, wide range of projects. We also, in addition to our schemes, we purchase new technology. So we try to keep up to date with what's happening around the world uh, and where we can identify technological in innovations that we believe can deliver value to the industry in Ireland, we, we tend to try and, and trial them. So what we'll do is we'll identify a technology. It could be a sensor for nitrites. It could be a different type of muscle barrel, for example. We, we'll purchase it, bring it to Ireland, and we'll assess it on a farm. Uh, now, this, this is research in a sense, but it's not it's not kind of research with controls and replicates and, you know, peer reviewed research. It's basically trying a new technology, bring it to a farm and seeing if it works and where it works. We will present the technology and disseminate that to the rest of industry. And then subsequently, we will aid industry through grant schemes in rolling out that technology. So that's something that we've done for the last 20 to 30 years and has been quite successful. And the reason it works is we kind of funnel suitable technology towards the farms. But we also save them the expense in conducting the research themselves and most importantly, de-risking the adoption of new technology. Because as everybody knows, not everything is going to work. And particularly in Ireland, uh, a lot of the farms operate in very exposed conditions along the western seaboard. So something that works in a bay in Norway or in the Mediterranean might not be easily transferable to the Irish uh, setup. I'm just going to outline a number of projects just to give you a broad overview of some of the projects we're involved in at the moment. This is just a snapshot. We've lots of different projects. I just picked out some to kind of highlight. 
So the first is uh, we're doing work on jellyfish tracking. So we have an issue occasionally where jellyfish will uh, inundate some salmon cages and cause mortality in fish. Um, so we've deployed drone technology to farms to identify where blooms are happening. So these are uh, drones that are able to land on water and where they identify a jellyfish bloom, the farmer can then deploy uh, mitigation measures to ensure that uh, that the fish aren't affected. Um, we have a project where we're looking at uh, light wavelengths to trigger smoltification. Um, again, that's been in done in conjunction with uh, a partner in a, in a research system. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of organic production and that means that some of the methods that we deploy for sea lice prevention, for example, um, they, they all have to be organically certified methods. So we use cleaner fish. So lumpfish have been rolled out in the last few years as, as a method of removing parasites from salmon. So when something like that happens, it's very important that we provide uh, fish and training and fish welfare workshops for industry so they understand how to look after that species. We're doing some work as well on ontogenous vaccines. This is in conjunction with GMIT. We're trying to develop uh, ontogenous vaccines for use with cleaner fish, trout and perch. Uh, we've all become experts in vaccines in the last year as well. And uh, ontogenous vaccines, um, the, the basic deployment method for them is we, we dip the fish in them. So it's less onerous than injecting fish. We've also deployed some desalination uh, plants for treatment for AGD and sea lice. I, I'll, I'll outline that in a bit more detail in a second. Um, but effectively, uh, where, where you have AGD, which is an amoebic gill disease, fresh water treatments can be utilized to, to help the fish. And so we have deployed some desalination plants to marine sites. We're also looking at the use of bubble curtains to reduce the impact of jellyfish and phytoplankton. I'll touch on that in, in a minute as well. We had a project with uh, AIT looking at the potential for freshwater algae to be used as probiotics and for bio compounds. We have another project on improved muscle long line flotation devices. So, um, an improved method which would allow uh, long line deployments in, in more exposed sites. And we, we run, as I, as I mentioned before, a number of different courses through the training colleges and in conjunction with, uh, with the FishVet group um, aimed at improving the skill levels of people who are working on the farms and identifying potential issues. We have a project called Samson Smoat with the Marine Institute, which they're running, um, which is looking at trying to produce larger smoats to reduce mortality at sea. And on the shellfish side, we have a, a project running to develop a nicer tracking apps, which would allow shellfish farmers to be able to more accurately manage their produce on the farm. So that's just to give you a kind of an overview of the types of projects that we have running um, at the moment within the industry. I'll just give you a, a, um, a kind of bit more detail on, on two or three of those. So the first is, as I mentioned, enhancing freshwater treatments for, for dealing with AGD and sea lice. Um, so this is an activity that in recent years, more and more farms have had to deploy where they bathe the fish in fresh water. Um, this can be quite stressful um, in terms of getting all the equipment in place on the farms, uh, treating the fish, pumping the fish, moving them around. So we're, we're looking at uh, more efficient methods to do this. Um, so I'm going to show you, if I can, a video here, if it'll play. Maybe it won't play because it's in slide mode. Yeah, is that is that running there, is it? Can everybody see that? It's moving fine, uh, Damien. It's just the audio. Uh, the yeah, audio. there's no audio. I'm I'm the audio in. I'll I'll commentate. So this is a a tow bag which we developed with industry, 
And the idea behind this is to allow fresh water to be moved from cage to cage. So this is a system that didn't exist. We sat down with industry and a supplier and we've uh, funded a prototype. And um, the idea is that it's a towable bag for uh, sea farms at sea where access to fresh water might be limited. So it can be filled with fresh water and then move from site to site. And um, that video there is actually been shot with one of the, dr the splash drones that we've deployed to the farms. So that's the drone there landing on the water just to show you it can, it can see underwater. So that's the one that we've deployed to fish farms to look at uh, jellyfish tracking. So it's just an example of the type of technology we're working with at the moment and sometimes how we kind of have to think outside the box and come up with new solutions to the problems that exist. Uh, bubble barriers, I think this is probably an example of something that we've kind of gone back to over time. So we, it, it's well known that if there's a curtain of bubbles in water, sometimes it can prevent algae or jellyfish moving into a, fi a fish cage. But the deployment of these barriers um, can be a bit hit and miss. So we've started some new work on it, and the idea is that it would be linked with, with real-time sensors. So to look at more efficient deployment of systems, we would have bubble curtains around a cage site, but they would be activated by sensors which would pick up um, an irritant in the water. So I think this is an example of where technology is heading, not only in terms of efficiency, so that it's only deployed when it has to be and it's using less energy, but in terms of utilizing real-time sensors which gives you a much better picture of what's happening in the marine environment than spot sensors. So I think that's going to be really important into the future is real-time sensors and how they're deployed. Just a brief overview on seaweed. I haven't really mentioned it, but it's kind of a topic that comes up a lot. Um, the seaweed industry in Ireland is around valued at about 37 million, but at the moment it's comparatively low value and high volume. So the majority of seaweed that's harvested is utilized for fertilizer products. Um, where, where BIM in the industry would like to get to is to increase the value of that and to be more involved in, in biotech and, and high value clusters. So we commissioned um, a seaweed report and we're, we're currently undergoing a seaweed strategy. Um, the seaweed scoping report looked at the development of a biorefinery for, for Ireland, which would allow us to extract higher value nutraceuticals from seaweeds. So that report kind of identified some two and a half thousand new products that were on the European market in the last 10 years containing seaweed. And the majority of that innovation is certainly happening within the France, France, Spain, Germany and the UK. And it's driving towards utilizing seaweeds for more food products and health products as well as cosmetics. So we've identified a number of potential um, key marine ingredients um, that could potentially provide greater value to the seaweeds we currently have. And the seaweed strategy will hopefully get us into a position where we provide the resources to the industry to achieve that. We're mainly focused at the moment on growing Alaria and Saccharina, which is the brown seaweed. Uh, we have about 180 hectares of licensed site at the moment, but, but another 50 hectares is coming on stream. So. This is something that we've seen a lot of licenses issued in the last number of years, and we expect to see that this sector grow. It's also an area where we're interested in seeing development in relation to multi-trophic systems, where seaweed would take up nutrients that are produced by other, uh, other aquaculture activities. One seaweed that's mentioned quite a lot is uh, asparagopsis. Um, asparagopsis is a seaweed which can reduce methane production within cattle by up to 98%. So given the current concerns about climate and environmental challenges, that's something that's generated a lot of interest. Um, however, although we have a number of trials in place, it's really just that early research stage. So the challenge there is going to be how do we scale it up and uh, produce enough of it to, to make an impact. I'm going to touch on the project that Ronan talked about there, the OASIS project, um, which um, might be of interest to our Finnish colleagues. So um, we have about 80,000 hectares of peatland in Ireland. This was predominantly used for, for fuel production in the past. Uh, 
obviously with the climate change uh, agenda and environmental regulation a lot of this has ceased so we're looking at diversification projects and um, aquaculture was one of the ones that was highlighted as having potential so we we started the trial in mount lucas uh, the farm underneath this cutaway peatland we have glacial till so we've established a trial unit which is on about five hectares. It's part of this overall wind farm site, which is um, about a thousand hectares. And the energy from the farm comes from this turbine 19 here. So it's it's entirely gets its energy from, from wind power and it's utilizing the circular economy. So on this farm, we only discharge when it rains. It doesn't abstract and discharge water. So effectively nine, 10 months of the year, there's no discharge from the farm. So just to briefly show you what happens is the fish are curtailed in, in these pill ponds and water is circulated through the treatment system where we utilize duckweed to take up the nutrients. And the reason we use duckweed is because we can then harvest the duckweed. So we have this kind of closed circular economy approach to, to, to fish farming on the site. Um, we've had a number of issues, but by and large, we've been quite successful in producing perch and trout. Uh, one of the issues we have is uh, the predominance of algae at certain times of year and how do we control that. Um, the algae is great at providing oxygen in the system and taking up nutrients, but you can also have nuisance algae as well. So further work has to be done on, on addressing that. Um, we've just started work on the duckweed in terms of using it as an alternative protein in salmon feed uh, diet. So that trial is, is ongoing. And ultimately, we, we hope on this site to develop the world's most sustainable fish farm. That's just a, a picture of the duckweed last summer there in one of the channels. We have about 16 channels like this with, with duckweed in it. So you, we can get really good coverage. Uh, duckweed's great because it can take up ammonia directly, has a protein content of about 40% and can double every 24 hours. So it's it's a really exciting, uh, a really exciting aquatic plant. Just briefly, I know I've only a minute or two left, but um, we also run in conjunction with Hatch uh, Aquaculture Accelerator Workshops. This is targeting companies that are developing products and services for the aquaculture industry. So what we're particularly interested in doing here is developing companies in Ireland that have products that could be traded globally. Um, so they would be based in Ireland, trial their products uh, on services, with our aquaculture farms, but very much have a global outreach in terms of where they might sell their products to. So every year we take about 10 companies that show um, high potential startup capacity. We put them in through the accelerator. A lot of these companies come from either the water sector or IT or have nothing to do with aquaculture, but they do have products that could be of benefit to the, to the aquaculture industry. So that's an interesting, um, accelerator program that we run with Hatch uh, every year and is, is already starting to, to deliver some dividends. So maybe it's something for some of the SMEs that uh, you guys are involved in that we, you know, could potentially avail of. Um, this is my last slide here. I just want to talk about the future challenges. It's, it's important for Ireland that any methodologies or products or services we develop um, meet organic principles. So, you know, we can't just take something off the shelf that's used sometimes for for treating uh, sea lice, for example, and apply it. It has to it has to meet organic standards. Um, climate change is having a significant impact already on on aquaculture, and we see that every year with new species of phytoplankton, uh, new fish health issues. Um, there may be opportunities from that as well in terms of new species that we could culture in Ireland, um, but it's something that's going to be a significant challenge going forward. We think there's going to be more development in IMTA systems, uh, self-contained systems and offshore aquaculture. And we see a lot of interest in, in developing in tandem with offshore wind farms, things like that. So we think that aquaculture could play a part in being part of that wider marine network as well. And as I mentioned, sensors for early warning are going to become commonplace so that we can understand more what's happening in the environment in which the farmers are trying to produce their fish. On the freshwater side, we've got a lot of, uh, and Ronan touched on this, a lot of, you know, 
pressures in terms of new directives, and there is a, a, a move towards more recirculating based systems and RAS, RAS type farms. And in terms of shellfish then as well, traceability is becoming an issue in terms of we've developed good markets for products, but we're now, see, now seeing a bit of counterfeiting happening. So we're going to have to develop systems to allow full traceability of shellfish for consumers, you know, so that if they get an oyster in Hong Kong and it says it's Irish, that they can they can be assured that it is Irish and that it's not a counterfeit product. So, so there's some of the areas that we think in the future we're going to have to uh, develop uh, products and services for. And my last slide then is just to show you a program we have called Taste the Atlantic, which allows uh, visitors to Ireland to, who travel along the western seaboard to visit aquaculture operations, to sample the products, to see the farms in operation and to learn a bit more about aquaculture. And I'd encourage any of you when the COVID restrictions lift, if you want to make a visit to Ireland, please, you know, look up the website and drop into any of the producers that participate in that and um, you'll get a very warm welcome. I think Ian, that is, that's me. That's it. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you very much, Damien. And we have uh, uh, some time to discuss because our Polish lecture will come some minutes minutes late. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. The beef production, as far as I know, so the island and Finland are the countries which have been used used the beef for 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 energy production the most and. Uh, I suppose it's not connected to aquaculture as such, but uh, I suppose there will be a quite big problems in the whole Europe because the peat has been used for the production of 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 vegetables and salad in 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 the in the houses houses. So that that would be also a problem. But let's say is is there a lot of discussion about these EU decisions? Because in Finland, it's a big political issue. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is a huge issue here. They've 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 committed just transition funds to allow for retraining of workers that are involved in peat harvesting, and the focus is is pretty much on rewetting uh, peatlands to allow for increased biodiversity. But one of the problems there is it doesn't really create jobs, although it increases biodiversity. It's not replacing the jobs that are lost. So, and equally so with wind farms and some solar projects, they're fantastic at producing energy, but again, they don't produce a lot of jobs. So really what we're trying to do is develop um, systems that can have sustainable fish production in tandem with biodiversity and create jobs. So you're trying to tick a lot of boxes in one go. And they're very sensitive environments as well. So you have to be cognizant of that. Um, but it's it's I would say an opportunity for Finland specifically because one thing that's curtailing aquaculture across Europe is licensing and space, and um, this is a big issue in Ireland, and it's the reason that our industry is relatively small. We could probably sell two, three times the amount of salmon that we could produce, but we 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 can't. We've no licenses to do that, so. We are in a position where there's a lot of consumer demand for products, but not enough supply. And with these peatlands, you've got space and that's and you've got water. So I think there's synergies there with other activities where aquaculture can definitely play a, a role. OK, so uh, I don't know which one was the first, but I am, please. <laughs> I, I, I don't know either. Um, Damien, thank you very much. Uh, really insightful uh, overview. Thank you. My, my question's about uh, Hatch. Um, we we run accelerator accelerators. We, we also run uh, an investment fund quite, quite uniquely. Um, in terms of Hatch, does it include um, a finance aspect to it as well in terms of growing the businesses after the first, I, I don't know if it's a year or 18 months, but but ha, ha, do, do you have a scaling um, program in terms of finance for them within that program? Yeah, that's a, a very good question, Ian. So, well, Hatch is a private company. It's, it's got its own global equity fund. Um, it's raising another fund at the moment. So it has invested in some of the companies itself. 
Uh, and similarly, during the accelerator program, we have other equity companies to come in. BIM um, is not in a position to directly put equity into funds, but obviously EI is Enterprise Ireland and Enterprise Ireland are involved in, in the workshops as well. So where Enterprise Ireland see potential, they can also put equity in. We would like to raise a fund in a specific aquaculture fund within Ireland. Um, however, that could only be done in conjunction with other agencies. And it's something that's definitely on the agenda as a next step. I, I would also add that we would like to develop an innovation hub as well. We're looking at that, at the idea of, of developing an innovation hub where these companies could be put in for a year or two, get them up to scale, get them up to speed and and, and give them a helping hand in development. Um, we think there's enormous potential within aquaculture globally and Ireland could play a role in that. So the benefit of that is you're seeing growth within aquaculture in Ireland that's not dependent on licensed production. You know, it's not it's not dependent on that. And we already have a lot of companies based in Ireland that 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 work globally in aquaculture. Uh, and Hatch is an example of that. Hatch is actually an Irish company. So I think there's a lot of potential in that space. Ian, you guys would have much more expertise in, in something like that, that than BIM have. It's something that we've only recently got involved in. But we felt that some of the challenges our clients face can only be addressed by helping companies develop products and services. So we, we it's something that we're just getting into, but we see enormous growth potential in. Well, not to, not to take too much time, because I know Patrick wants to ask you, but I, I think this is an incredibly positive development from today's thing, because we're on the same side of trying to create that dynamic of a job rich sure. environment, I guess. What I would say is uh, we have assets, um, they're over 50 million, so we're, we're looking for homes. And it would be great to talk to you after this because we have technology companies within aquaculture, but I personally wasn't aware of such a, a really good idea that you have going there. And it could be just a, it could be just a referral or that, or it could be something more than that. But absolutely, yeah, yeah, an excellent outcome. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, we 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 we'll, we'll sit down and have a chat, and yeah, tease to it. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, and Heinim, Petri Heinim. Yeah, yeah, okay. Th thank you very much for the very interesting presentations from Ireland. Both of them have been very interesting. <clears throat> I would like to ask about the uh, sea lice. That are you familiar with this Norwegian system that they kill it, they kill them by lasers. They have yes. this kind of automatic system. So as you have this organic production, so that that might fit into it. Quite nice. Yeah, we have a company in Ireland, uh, Atlantic Photonic Systems, which is actually based over in, in Mayo, and um, they actually went through our hatch program, and we've a number of other promoters with innovative technologies around sea lice. So yeah, there's there's a lot of, I mean, one of the challenges that they face in in some respects is is scale and proving the technology. And uh, what I have found over the years, um, Patrick, is there's a lot of companies with really good ideas, but it's getting them to commercial scale and getting them deployable is yeah. a real hard element of it, you know? And in fact, I've, I've come across very few bad ideas uh, over the years. Like, uh, <laughs> it, it, that's the easy bit in, in a way of, yeah. I don't mean it's an easy bit, but the challenge is, you know, getting that into a commercial product that's robust, that works and that a farmer can rely upon. And I would say farmers are reluctant to take on technologies because every fish farm around the world that I've been to has got a little graveyard around the back of technology or equipment that was promised A, B and C, but didn't deliver any of it. So, you know, that's what we find. I would say, I don't, I don't know the figures, but probably for every three or four new technologies that we try, probably one is, is successful, you know. Um, you know, they, and one of the main aspects there is just a challenging environment. What works in one country might not necessarily work here. So, um, but but yeah, yeah, it is um, that there, there is a lot of exciting technology around um, sea lice prevention and, and yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would like to ask about the duck beads. So we have also, I don't know if if. Petri Heinema knows and and uh, and and um, 
about Tero Nieminen, who is also presented because I think they we had some some experiments. I don't know exactly if it's the same species, but it is used for purification of the waters which are flowing out of uh, aquaculture. It was used in, in Kainu. Heinima, Petri or, or Tero, can you comment this one? Yes, we have a couple of projects that uh, is investigating that can it be used as a nutrient circulation, but uh, the bigger scale uh, test, tests are done next summer, so we don't have yet the full scale data, but it's very promising. Yeah, we, had, I, we had one of your colleagues from Luke was over, I think, two years ago on site looking at the duckweed. Um, yeah, yeah. He was involved in the project. Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I just can tell that I know that guys are doing it and, and they have also in Lauka in some tanks, but but not really know what's the, what's really the result at the moment. So so but probably the same people. Yeah, yeah. So if I remember right, so it seems that the ducks like the weed because as far as I remember right, so the first year it was uh, looking at the experiment in, in Kainu region. So the white ducks came there and ate the, the weed. And <laughs> we did yes. the, the results. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard that as well. Yeah, we, we don't have that issue specifically in uh, in Ireland. Um, we don't have such large yeah, duck populations that could come in. And But I, I guess that's a result in some ways because it's it's the circular economy. Like we have swans on site and uh, they harvest the duckweed and eat it and convert it to swan and then they, they fly off. So I think what we're looking at here is not discharging nutrients into the environment. And if we can utilize them and uh, take them up and abstract them, then we, we fulfill that circular economy approach. And uh, so it, you know, the only disadvantage of ducks eating it is, you know, that there's a potential value for the duckweed. So you could potentially sell it and make money. But in terms of it fulfilling its use, the ducks are still providing some benefit in, in consuming the duckweed because you're removing those nutrients. OK, thank you. We will continue with the program. And as far as I see, the Professor Darius Kutsarczyk is presented. Sorry for my pronunciation. I, I have I, ha, I have to say that Finnish Finnish uh, names are also difficult for the for the foreigners, and at least for me, the Polish names are quite difficult ones. <laughs> yes, exactly the same. Uh, I will try to push my presentation. Ooh, yep. Please, uh, did you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I will try to to present some information about the aquaculture in uh, Poland. The main subject is uh, aquaculture in Baltic Sea, but this is very diff difficult subject. Uh, why I uh, show you for uh, a moment. Uh, in the case of the Polish uh, aquaculture, they are mainly freshwater, and uh, we have usually two main uh, types of uh, aquaculture, usually extensive, which is the pond aquaculture, mainly of cyprinids and uh, some sturgeons, some uh, predators like uh, northern pike or pike perch. Uh, intensive uh, aquaculture in uh, ponds, there are mainly salmonids. And of course, this is some uh, recirculated aquaculture symptoms, but now it's, in my opinion, more is in the perspective in the future, not in the present. But of course, some uh, farms 
uh, established and they are work mainly with the uh, eel. Uh, in the case of the Polish aquaculture uh, annual production, this is the main species is the common carp. This is usually between 18 to 12,000 tons per year. Uh, other cyprinids, there are mainly Chinese carp uh, and tench. There are usually about 2,000 tons. Uh, the next, this is the rainbow trout, uh, some sturgeons, mainly uh, they are uh, cultured for caviar, uh, Atlantic salmon, African catfish, and uh, other fishes, but uh, this uh, other production is really fluctuated because uh, a few years ago uh, in Poland was produced uh, more than 1000 tons of uh, tilapias, but now it's totally decreased, so it's really fluctuated uh, year by year. And uh, of course, in Poland uh, is the huge production of stocking uh, material. Uh, we have a lot of uh, lakes, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, rivers, and uh, uh, they are usually managed by uh, private company or some uh, anglers associations, and uh, they must uh, stock every year a lot of uh, uh, fishes, and of course somebody must uh, produce this stocking material. There are usually, uh, of course, uh, salmonids, there are many brown trout and uh, some uh, salmon and uh, sea trout. Uh, there are uh, cyprinids, uh, usually rheophilic uh, cyprinids. Uh, there are predators like uh, northern pike, uh, pike perch, some perch, some whales, uh, some barbot. So the stocking uh, production is really huge and this is the uh, really big market for uh, such fish. And now is the question, where is the marine aquaculture in Poland? Uh, as I said in the beginning, this is the really difficult uh, problem because it's uh, practically not uh, exist. Uh, from many uh, reasons. Of course, there are some uh, research, some, uh, how to say, uh, technical problem which uh, start to be uh, developed, but uh, for now we have practically have nothing production in, uh, in the sea. Why? Because the Baltic Sea is uh, more like uh, brackish or fresh water than uh, normal seawater. Uh, the, the Baltic Sea have very low salinity. In the Polish seaside is about uh, seven per decimai. In the, for example, uh, Finland coast was much lower. Uh, this is uh, sea which have low temperature uh, in comparison to uh, other uh, similar uh, seas. They are very polluted, usually by heavy metals, but not only. And this is very stormy sea. And uh, they have very dangerous uh, short waves, uh, which may uh, destroy, for example, cage constructions. And uh, in the Polish uh, uh, part of sea, they have no base, no fjords, so really they have no any possibilities to hide, for example, uh, uh, cage, cages from the wind and uh, waves. But uh, because uh, the Baltic Sea is uh, rather than brackish uh, waters, so in such environment uh, lives many fish species which uh, are very interesting for the uh, uh, aquaculture as a new uh, uh, species for uh, aquaculture and some of them they are start to uh, to be cultured. Uh, the main species of course in my opinion this is the pike perch this is the whitefish, this is the barbot, and this is the perch. 
Uh, in the case of the perch, because this is the Damien here as an expert, so I know will be uh, present the uh, our results, but uh, of this uh, first three, I uh, show you short uh, information. Of course, uh, the main question is why uh, this species? Uh, some few reasons, but uh, I try to find uh, some reasons which are uh, may be used in all of the species. Uh, the first, they may be uh, cultured in uh, water of low salinity. Uh, and uh, of the species may be uh, cultured. They have the uh, tasty meat. Uh, they have the really high price in the market. Uh, I like to uh, show you the price of, for example, of uh, carcass of barbot. They are usually out of the market, so there is uh, no present practically in the, for example, Polish market. And the technologies of uh, artificial reproduction uh, and uh, production under controlled conditions of the species are developed and may be uh, applied for the intensive uh, aquaculture. Uh, I will uh, present uh, some information uh, about the, uh, the first of the uh, pike perch. Is the uh, species in which we work from many years. We start in the 20th century work with pike perch. And uh, later, uh, some methods are really uh, fast uh, develop uh, when uh, in my my team star work uh, Daniel Jarski. Uh, he was my PhD student and uh, he was the main author of uh, many pike perch uh, technologies. And uh, this species is uh, really difficult. Uh, for intensive uh, production because production of pike perch that are usually connected from many of bottlenecks. And practically each point of culture, there are the bottlenecks which should be uh, uh, developed. The first was uh, artificial uh, pro reproduction. I later show you some uh, information from uh, this point. Then uh, insemination, egg incubation, spawner survival. In uh, many times the survival was very low. Uh, and uh, when we connect the data from uh, Czech and Polish uh, fish farmers from over 20 years, uh, we find that uh, survival was uh, from this many fish farms and from both these countries uh, is about uh, five percent uh, per year. In some years, uh, the total mortality of spawners after spawning was observed. So it's a really big problem to collect the new uh, spawners. Uh, the next. Uh, to bottlenecks there are first feeding of uh, larvae and uh, inflation of swim blader. Uh, in the case of the pike perch, the larvae usually the first start uh, to feed and after a few days they start to inflation swim blader. So is the problem with the fish farmers uh, start to use uh, 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 starters, dry uh, starters for the first uh, feeding. Uh, the next problem is uh, cannibalism and uh, sudden death syndrome, which are usually observed uh, not only in the larvae, but also in the juveniles and uh, in the semi-adult uh, fish. Uh, in the case of uh, artificial uh, reproduction uh, on these pictures it's see that it's not uh, very uh, difficult but uh, 
is uh, there really a lot of uh, problems. Uh, the one of them is the uh, our site uh, uh, developmental stages and uh, each uh, stage uh, it was fined uh, six of them each stage uh, there require uh, another protocol of reproduction uh, sometimes another protocol of uh, applied uh, hormones for involving phenol uh, or metroation so it's uh, really some uh, problems which should be developed and uh, also, this is the problem of uh, spontaneous releasing of eggs uh, by uh, maturated females and it takes only few seconds and for example from five kilo females, the one million of eggs should be going out during few seconds. So it's uh, really a problem to uh, uh, develop such uh, uh, techniques. Uh, the most important things is uh, sampling of uh, our site. We use uh, usually uh, catheters, uh, medical catheters. It's not the, the problem to uh, obtain them. And uh, after uh, sampling, we may uh, use for all site maturation uh, stage. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, all site except uh, last two stages, they are not normally transparent. It should be uh, kept in the Sera solution. Uh, but uh, uh, Daniel Zarski uh, found six uh, stages. The first uh, two stages there are usually uh, when we have the females they are too early for uh, applied hormonal injection the fish in the last stage uh, there are not need uh, hormonal injection because they if they will be still alive they are usually ovulated uh, but uh, what is also important when we collect the females from ponds from lakes from the white or from the uh, uh, culture it or the white stock we usually find that uh, usually find the all developmental stages so if we collect 10 females we can find six different stages so what is uh, uh, good for for the species in the nature in the white because they spawn not all at the same time this is not good for uh, aquaculture and uh, for this reason it is really necessary to uh, check the uh, oocyte maturation in all females uh, but not only in one or two as a, as a group. Uh, after uh, um, Fertilization, this is the problem with uh, egg stickiness. So very sticky and uh, this is the uh, problem to uh, we must apply the special buff usually in uh, uh, timing acid. But what is uh, important uh, if we take this buff too long or uh, in too high uh, uh, concentration. We have the problem with uh, larvae hatchability. Uh, on this uh, photos, you may see the uh, pike perch larvae, which uh, have the pigment in the eyes. This is uh, the result of uh, too high tiny concentration. Normally, pike perch larvae there are uh, hatched uh, before. Uh, 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 before pigment was uh, visible in the, the eyes. Uh, in the case of the uh, culturing, uh, this is not very difficult species, but uh, I avoid one uh, problem, which is the uh, egg uh, oocyte quality. We have also developed a special method to determine the quality of uh, possible quality of uh, the 
uh, eggs and uh, put it on the larvae. But uh, in many uh, times we have observed that the larvae can do not uh, eat or do not uh, inflation, uh, infla uh, inflate the swim blader. Of course, we may uh, avoid such larvae, but this is the uh, it's maybe problem in, for the uh, fish uh, farmers. And of course, uh, when the larvae start to eat and they inflate the swim blader, uh, the next we may have the problem with cannibalism. But before it, I want to show you the two pike pitch larvae. Uh, this uh, upper have uh, inflated swim blader but this lower uh, not. And now they are look similar, but uh, after a few days, uh, the fish which have uh, not inflated swim blader, they are start to be deformed. Usually skeleton was deformed. This is like on uh, this uh, uh, picture. And uh, such fish have the really different kind of uh, skeleton deformities. There are lordosis, kyphosis, scoliosis, sometimes all of them. And such fish uh, are still alive. They are growing lower than uh, normal fish, but growing. And uh, they may be later problem with uh, we're going, for example, for uh, uh, fish processing uh, because there is not possibility to um, prepare phylet from such uh, fish. Uh, the next species, which may be very interesting, is the white fish. Uh, due to lakes eutrophication, we have the problem with natural population of uh, this species. And uh, the species are very popular in the uh, Polish customers. So I know that uh, one of the uh, fish processing uh, plant want to take the special action in the supermarket with white fish. And uh, last uh, two years they are looked in the market for white fish. They need only, how they say, 20 tons of white fish and then buy nothing. It's uh, practically impossible to buy this species uh, in the market. Of course, uh, I know few fish farms which uh, start to produce white fish in the uh, uh, concrete uh, ponds, uh, which are usually used for rainbow trout. But of course, uh, one or two fish farms start to work with uh, RAS systems with uh, whitefish. Uh, and uh, uh, short information about uh, whitefish. This is the cold water species. They have quite short production cycle because you are really growing uh, fast and uh, have the possible polyculture with uh, sturgeons. So this is the also uh, possibility, like in case of the uh, pike perch, to use sturgeons uh, in the polyculture. And uh, uh, last uh, species in which I uh, want to prepare some information, this is the barbot. Uh, it sometimes names as the freshwater cod. Uh, in uh, some European uh, countries, like for example Belgium, is very high prices in the market. The carcass is over 60 euros per kilogram. Uh, the liver is uh, much more expensive. Uh, in some uh, countries, it's called as the royal uh, dish. And also in Poland, we find the information that in the middle century, there are only four royal dishes from fish and uh, barbot liver is one of them. Uh, in the case of uh, barbot, we develop whole cycle from uh, artificial reproduction to fattening. Uh, of course, this is some uh, also bottlenecks, uh, one of uh, 
them is uh, temperature regime, especially for the larvae, because this is uh, normally called that it's very cold water species, but uh, the larvae do not uh, want to eat uh, when the temperature is below 12 uh, Celsius degree. So it's really uh, important uh, things that in very low temperature, the larvae can uh, start to uh, eat. Uh, this is also a problem with swim bladder inflation, but uh, in comparison to, for example, to pike perch or perch, the larvae which not inflate swim bladder, they usually die. Uh, there is the really problem with cannibalism. Uh, we have the lot of data that, for example, larvae which have uh, uh, eight millimeters long can eat larvae which have six mil millimeters long. So this is a very short difference, but one larvae can uh, eat uh, as whole uh, another. Uh, in the case of the larger uh, barbot, barbot which have 12 millimeters long can eat larvae which have 8 millimeters long. But uh, when they start to uh, eat uh, dry food, there is usually no problem with culture, but except one uh, thing, one thing is that uh, uh, they must be feed on dry food to the end of the culture. Because if they obtain uh, another kind of food, for example, I don't know, hyonomid larvae, uh, some small fishes, they of course eat this uh, natural food, but they usually do not want to start eat dry food again. So it's very important uh, to uh, keep the uh, lar larvae and juveniles and uh, semi-adult which uh, eat the dry food uh, on this uh, kind of food to the end of the culturing. And this is the end of my uh, presentation. I present this three uh, species which can, in my opinion, be a perspective of uh, new aquaculture species in Poland and of course I hope not only in Poland. Thank okay, you. thank you very much Darius. It was very interesting, interesting presentation and um, you know the burbot it's it's also valuable fish in, 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 in Finland but it's very seasonal one. Um, it is used mainly in January, February, because its its spawning time is during the winter time. So at that time, people people eat burbot, and the raw is 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 especially very highly valued delicatessen. Uh, the liver is also used, but nowadays not that much than earlier. Um, I have no idea if we have had any 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 experiments with uh, with uh, aquacultures purpose. Can Petri Heinemann say? Have you heard about that? No, we have been uh, cultivating it in Taivalakoski earlier, uh, but the main main purpose was uh, stocking purposes because uh, in some areas we have uh, uh, problems with the natural reproduction of of purpose. But at the moment, we are not farming it. Yeah. I know in Poland we have also problems with present barbot of the market. And usually we may obtain the, the breeders when they are during the migration, spawning migration, because the last two, the, the last, the biggest uh, two stock of uh, barbot in Poland, this is the Brekish water, this is the Szczecin Lagoon and Vistulas Lagoon. So with the, they are usually live in the um, uh, Brekish water, they have about 2% MI of salinity. So this, I think the similarity like in the uh, Baltic Sea near Finland. 
Uh, and of course, we have in some deep, uh, like we also some uh, have barbed population, but usually they are really near extinct. And of course, uh, we produce uh, a lot of barbot for restocking. Usually, uh, restock uh, the specimens which have four or five centimeters uh, long because because they have the high survive rate in comparison, especially to the to the larvae. But of course, I know that uh, one or two farms uh, there I start to produce uh, uh, commercial size barbot. I know that uh, during the first year they have the very good results because they start uh, rearing larvae in the March and after one year they obtain the fish which have the uh, man weight about one kilograms. So it's uh, really market size uh, fish. Uh, I know that in this year they are also will try to to produce market size, but now of course they have the, I don't know, about two centimeters long juveniles. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know that uh, if we think Lapland, so we have uh, some purpose stocks which are basically living at the Botnia Bay, but they are, they are wandering up the river Tornio to spawn. So, so it's interesting to see that they are catching the catching the burpot from a, from, a, from a river when they are going up to spawn. Uh, do you have any other questions for, for uh, Darius? Okay, Damien have something to ask, please. Yeah, hi Darius, how are you? Hi. Um, I'm just interested about the carp farms in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Like, is there a move now to diversify? Or are they still focused on the traditional methods? So do, do you see more carp farms starting to diversify into new species? Uh, yes, I mean, they, of course, uh, our fish farmers uh, looks for the uh, new species or possibility to, uh, to culture new species, but uh, Common carp is still the the main uh, species. There are usually culture for Christmas, and uh, for example, from last Christmas we have the problem with uh, uh, carp because due to pandemia there is no import from Czech, uh, and this the really problem with uh, buying uh, carp uh, for for Christmas. Uh, and I know that also this spring, this is the something like uh, madness that people uh, look for the uh, carp for uh, culture. So this is for me very strange uh, situation. But of course the farmers look for the uh, new species. Some of them, if they have the, for example, uh, spring in the ponds, uh, they try to culture white fish if uh, they know that uh, the water temperature during summer would be about 18 or maximum 20 Celsius degree. So they are looking for whitefish. Uh, some of other people look for uh, possibly to culture pike perch or perch. And uh, I know that uh, still from year by year it's uh, increasing interesting of this uh, both uh, species, pike perch and perch. Uh, and of course, the farmers look for the new uh, methods. But of course, we have the one problem uh, if in the ponds with uh, white animals, usually with black cormorant. Cormorant, yeah. A, a really huge population in, uh, in Poland of these birds. And uh, because black cormorant is strictly protected, in Poland, so it's not too easy to uh, sometimes uh, culture in uh, usually uh, in very high density, for example, perch or pie perch, because you know if the near cormorant colony visit your ponds, that's the really large the pond, so it's not possible to protect them uh, on the nest on the surface. So sure, okay. Okay, thanks, Darius. 
Okay, by the way, in, in both of Ireland and in Poland, do you have a problem with the seals? Uh, in, 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 in sea, Baltic Sea. Yes, yes, and uh, our fishermen have the really uh, big problem uh, with seals. Uh, usually, when they uh, try to catch uh, salmon or sea trout, uh, because uh, the since uh, they learn very quickly, that is the something like I don't know. Uh, uh, a fast food bar or something like this. So uh, I know that there are special uh, programs. If the uh, fishermen uh, have the, uh, uh, how to say, have the some part of, for example, salmon, for example, head, the rest was eaten by, by seals. So they may obtain the extra money for this, but sometimes they only. Uh, find that uh, nets with uh, big holes, uh, without fishes, without seals. So, uh, for some fishermen, is the really big problem. But of course, uh, the seals are also strictly protected. So, this is uh, very different to uh, uh, connected to these two things. The uh, a lot of wide, strictly protected uh, animals, and for example, culturing fish uh, in the in the wild or uh, fishing them. Okay, thank you. In in Finland, it's it's possible to to hunt it, but it's very difficult animal to hunt nowadays. We don't have any more the tradition, and and the funny thing is that even if you hunt it, so you can't sell the seal meat or even seal skin it's 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 because of the eu regulations so so people are not very eager to hunt it as it is quite difficult i don't know what is the situation in ireland do you have a problem with that because in finland it seems that it is also a problem for the aquaculture in certain areas yeah it, it is in certain areas i mean as darius said they're protected um but I think it highlights the need for we, we, we have to come up with solutions that somehow protect the operations of the aquaculture farms, but don't impact on the environment in which they operate. So I think it's, it's it just highlights again the kind of challenges that farmers face and the need for solutions to those that kind of, um, you know, are agreeable to everybody that's involved, all the stakeholders. So. Seals are just one, and um, we've we've issues on freshwater farms with herons, particularly as well. Cormorants less so in Ireland. Uh, mink, otter, yeah, lots of freshwater predators who, yeah, they take advantage, and uh, I don't blame them. If they see some nice fish, they're gonna they're gonna try and take them. So it's just coming up with innovative solutions, I think. But it highlights again the potential for for opportunities for 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 companies to develop these products. Okay, uh, we are running out of time. Do you have any any further questions? If not, so I, I would like to ask the presenters to to send me their presentations. It was it has been asked by some some uh, some viewers here that uh, is it possible to put them into the extra SMEs web pages web pages so so if it's possible that you can send uh, send the presentations to me and maybe to Ian also directly because Ian is is taking care of of this extra SMEs let's say main web page web page also so we can put them put them there and and uh, as you know we have also recorded this one so we will we will find out with Ian uh, how we will put into the page, web pages. Okay, at least for me, it has been very interesting to hear what is what is happening in Ireland, what is happening in Poland. I had a lot of different kind of ideas. I have to maybe discuss with Petri Heinima about the possible future cooperation and what kind of things we can 
we can find out. So, so Petri, can you also comment maybe? Yeah, very interesting and then very good presentations and interesting issues. Very, very interesting afternoon. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's be in touch. Uh, the presentations can be found later from the extra SMEs web pages. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.